So, hey, everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, we know a little bit about where you're at. Sarah gave us some of the geographic coordinates. And so it seems like we have people from all over, from Indonesia, Greece, Switzerland, Brooklyn, um, Rwanda, I think, as well. I'm, I'm not sure if everybody's going to show up, but that was the list. And, uh, and that's very exciting to be speaking to you all. Um, the, we're going to say a little bit about the program and how it works and how it's structured and how it was conceived uh, and maybe even talk a little bit about the application process because I'm guessing that's one of the reasons you're all here is to think about applying and what that might mean and then we'll answer whatever questions you might have about the program but but just to say a few basic things the the it's a CCCP, Critical Curatorial Conceptual Practices and Architecture. It's, I guess we used to call it a young program. Now it's in its adolescence. <laughs> it's around 14 years old, uh, but but still, you know, growing in terms of um, innovating and, and expanding through our graduates um, and expanding to all parts of the planet. Um, it's a two-year graduate degree. Uh, it's a research-oriented graduate degree. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that research is, but, but it might be helpful just to understand a little bit about its history. It was conceived in a way to allow students to sharpen their research and writing skills. Um, and at the same time, it was designed as a platform for students to develop different approaches to practicing architecture, or I guess approaches to practicing architecture differently. And, and by this, we mean that students come into the program in order to think about how to become research scholars in architecture, to develop conceptual and research-oriented design practices, to think about being curators or how to work in museums or galleries uh, via a research design practice or a research practice, or to work in publications and or as editors, or, or to, divine, to define entirely different paths or trajectories or practice. Um, and, and so with that, you know, relatively broad set of ambitions for the program, the, that what that meant is that the program also has a relatively open structure. Um, in the first year, there are only two required courses. There are the colloquia that we teach, each one of us teaches one per semester, and then the students are required to take three other classes. And, and those classes can be whatever electives best fits the student's research trajectory. So that might be that a student who is very interested in history and theory and architecture specifically takes those classes within the School of Architecture. But we have students who take classes in our history. Um, they take other classes at GSAP that might not only be history theory related, there are visual studies classes that are sometimes really relevant or different types of research courses within GSAP. Students this semester are taking classes at the law school, which has never happened before, and somebody's taking a class <laughs> in the music school. We've had students take classes in the film school, um, anthropology or the um, MESAS, which is the Middle East uh, and uh, African South Studies Asian. Program, South Asian and African Studies Program. Um, and, and so, so this structure allows you to take courses from where you want. And, and, and the reasoning is that you will have a very specific research agenda as you come into the program or a set of research interests. And, and those classes that you will take will help you develop those research interests, or, or you may have an idea about what the research is that you want to do. You might think that you are interested in something that has a kind of anthropological bent, and so you'll take classes to see how that works. Um, and so, so the freedom of the curriculum is also a chance for students to explore different methods and to work with different faculty across the university, but also to start thinking about honing and developing their individual research work. Um, maybe maybe yeah, just add yeah. one more point, no, the, uh, which is to say that, you know, some students, um, as Mark alluded to, come in having a very clear uh, research agenda and direction. Sometimes it relates to their previous education or modes of practice. Sometimes it's entirely different. And, and you know, as Mark indicated, you know, this, um, this openness of the curriculum 
allows students flexibility. And for some people, that's a very easy thing to navigate. For other people, they might need a lot of advice from us. And, you know, we're always here as resources, as our other faculty to try and think through curating how to program that transition through the resources available to, at a major research university and within a, a school of architecture and, and planning and, and, and preservation. So, so, you know, it's not that, you know, you, I mean, some people do have a clear sense of why they're coming to the program and even what they might work on for thesis. That's very rare, to be honest. And, and even if people do, that often changes dramatically as they encounter, you know, very different ideas and modes of, of uh, you know, of, of documenting and researching and making arguments in the coursework in the first year. And that's also another reason to choose classes is to encounter different methods, different intellectual frameworks, um, uh, different challenges in terms of what you're expected to produce um, through that research. And, and so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's you know, people, you know, often ask us, um, you know, how do we choose? And again, for some people, that's self-evident and we have to like make them choose less, like, no, 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 you can't take seven classes, <laughs> ever get the work done. And for other people, it's part of a conversation about, you know, what your interests are, uh, you know, what you want to test out, where you're heading. And, and you know, just as people come from lots of different academic and professional and practical backgrounds, um, as, as Mark said, people are heading towards very different sort of career objectives. And, um, and, and so this is, I mean, this is one of the most sort of amazing things about those, um, those that first year, also about the thesis year, but the coursework year is you'll often be in classes with people who work in very different ways and, you know, you'll learn from them, you'll feed off them, you might end up collaborating with them, but the ambition is not to make all CCCP students look alike in the sense of, you know, come out at the other end with the same um, tailored curriculum or, or, or sort of identity. Uh, and I just, you know, want to underscore, you know, Mark used the term research um, uh, repeatedly and knowingly this is in, indeed it's a research driven program more than a design oriented program. Um, you know, people do sometimes make drawings and, and for, there's a you know creative element certainly to some of the output, but um, where you know really training people it's not like a practical program in the sense of training you how to become a curator in the sense of what it would be like to work in a gallery. Those are the sorts of things you learn outside outside the program. Sometimes with the program's help or the school's help. Sometimes beyond it, in internships um, and the like. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe we should talk a little bit about thesis then. Uh, just, so if, yeah. if the first year has uh, open structure for all of the reasons that Felicity has just articulated, um, and, and I think it's important just, I know she said this very clearly, but I'm just going to say it again. You're not left on your own. When we say it's open, that doesn't mean you're abandoned. It means that you have freedom, but you also have lots of advice. We ask all of our incoming students to speak to us about their course selection, to make sure that it makes sense for what they're planning, to make sure that they're not um, overburdening themselves. Um, and, and, and so maybe parenthetically, it's also important to say this, that within a relatively large university and a relatively large school, CCCP is a quite small and intimate program. You have both Felicity and I are there to speak to you and, um, and you have a tight relationship with your cohort and you develop a relationship with the second year students. Um, and there's a network of alumni within New York and internationally who we invite back to the program that you will develop. Uh, and sometimes a collaborative relationship, sometimes a social intellectual relationship with. Um, anyway, back to thesis. So the second year is primarily devoted to the thesis work. You take one other class, you're required to take one other class per semester, and ideally that class somehow meshes with your thesis research objectives or, or um, 
Or it might be that you're doing a project that does require some kind of technical skill. We've got students who've done like critical mapping projects and so they've had to learn those skills. And so you might do that in second year, take a class that helps you think through the format of your thesis. Um, the, the thesis is a one year project. It's a independent original research project The you work with an advisor that you um, select, I guess that's the right word, or you, <laughs> I'm not sure that's exactly the relationship. You find an advisor through asking people that you have studied with and you have developed a relationship to work with you over the year. And you will meet with that advisor as often as seems right for you. Sometimes you will meet with that advisor once every two weeks, sometimes every few weeks, it will depend where you are in the semester. If you're working through difficult conceptual problems, you might work more often. If you're in intense writing or production mode, it might be less often. Um, but you, there's also a structure to the thesis beyond your work, your work with your advisor. There are four major reviews throughout the, the year. And this, this year, the first one is tomorrow. And the students will present a 10 to 15 minute synthesis of the work that they've been developing. And, and so because there are four throughout the year, each one of those presentations is slightly different. The demands on them, how, whether they're presenting a, a proleptically a project that they're just starting and they're imagining is going to unfold, whether they're presenting at the end of the year, they have an opposite problem, how to synthesize a complex project that has unfolded and has different layers and different aspects. Um, so as because of that structure for presentations, each student not only has to think about how to articulate their project uh, to a new audience four times, but also have to think about where they are within their project, what, what they've done and what's coming next, um, and how to, how to think about communicating complicated and complex research projects. And, and, and so that structure, we have learned has been really useful to the students in helping them progress, but also in helping them synthesize and clarify and crystallize the um, uh, ambitious research projects. Hmm. Maybe I'll just add that you know, around those those reviews, you know, we adopt a model sort of related to, to design reviews um, um, in the sense of we have invited guest critics and also in addition to Mark and I, other, students advisors that are not Mark and I, you know, from the faculty. And, and so it's also really a fantastic collective conversation in which your um, students not only get feedback on their own work, but they get, you know, immersed in a, in a discussion about research techniques, about making arguments, uh, about the relationship between content and format. And, and Mark used this, um, made this allusion to format. The review is, is one format, but, um, the thesis itself can can um, uh, take less conventional. I mean, it can take a conventional format of a written, you know, history theory document. This is a format, uh, but sometimes students choose to work on exhibition projects or film projects or uh, uh, mapping projects. So, so the the format question it could be a a sort of dossier of of critical writing if somebody wanted to become a critic, you know, so the, the format is very flexible to allow for people to really build a voice in the, the you know, particular practice that they're interested in, um, or, or just to experiment and to really push that question of, of how, how ideas and material are made public, how they're disseminated, like what the, the mode of sort of audience address might be, what the material conditions of that are, the media conditions of that. And so this is, I think, a particularly unique thing about CCCP theses is that they're not just eight and a half by 11 or, you know, like they're, they're, mm -hmm. um, uh, they take on many roles. I mean, there's always a written component in a, and a thesis claim and, a, um, and an articulation of the, of the stakes and these sorts of things. But um, but sometimes they resolve into something like a work, um, and and you know these are these are things that people uh, sometimes know at the beginning of the thesis year. Sometimes actually they emerge in the course of 
of you know navigating the material and getting feedback and getting new ideas and um so i think this is actually a really sort of interesting part about um of, of the program and and yeah allows people to put forward their strengths and yeah <laughs> um, yeah i think that i agree that that is such a important and productive and fruitful aspect of the program and as Felicity said, it would be very, very rare for somebody to hand us a stack of eight and a half by 11 <laughs> sheets, um, in part because there's, I don't think there's a precedent for that, number one, and two, the, the conversation would have, and, unless there was a very clear conceptual reason for doing that, the conversation throughout the year would have foreclosed that as a format possibility. Um, but, but so many people will submit written, primarily written theses, but but they'll be working with images, they'll be working with media, they'll be working with archives, there'll be, there'll be evidence of the textual or material um, uh, that the research is organized around. And so the question is, how should that come into a publication? How should that be communicated? What is, what is the, the simple question of how many images to use and, and how would you show them? Suddenly changes the status of the thesis document from a kind of obligation to toward as Felicity said a kind of work and that's what we're interested in and and by work we don't really you know mean that we frame it and put it in the wall but 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 something that has clear ambitions about how it is circulates and is read and has addressees and and is disseminated those are the questions that come back again and again in the conversation around the format of thesis projects so maybe you know if they're the um, the sort of key components of the, the academic curriculum and and expectations, we should say a little bit more about the sort of you know informal aspects of the of the uh, you know what are also seen to be pedagogical initiatives. And I'm not just talking about the public lecture series and those things, but they're really important. And and at least one a year is driven by CCCP. We also run workshops to to introduce you to people um, uh, either in the city or who are coming through who have a particular type of practice that we think is really relevant to CCCP. Uh, we take students to museum visits on occasion when we think the work or the curatorial logic, um, you know, merits a, a, a sort of collective trip. Um, so then there, there's, you know, there's a lot of other um, pieces of, you know, spaces in which there are larger conversations that are taking place. There are also uh, a series of things like assistantships or job mm -hmm. opportunities or fellowships, like all the sort of fine print of programs that some people are interested in knowing about at the point of thinking about the application. And um, so there are, yeah, there are, yeah, I mean, the admissions office is actually much more versed on the the larger scholarship question and all of those things, but there are also a lot of our students work with the publications office, with the events and communications office, uh, with the gallery, which is uh, not yet really fully up and running. There's a, a new director um, uh, that hasn't launched his first show yet, but there's a, um, a sort of informal network of employment opportunities that are are really geared towards sort of our student body being the the answers to them. There are other assistantships working as teaching um, teaching fellows or research assistants. These sorts of things. The the Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture often hires our students. Um, Barnard, which is where the undergraduate architecture program between Columbia and Barnard colleges are, um, also regularly hires our students as as teaching assistants for some of their courses, uh, which can be a fantastic opportunity for somebody who's thinking about testing a, you know, a voice in teaching and getting that experience in the classroom. Um, so there's lots of these sort of, yeah, informal, informal, there's a Avery Library, as I'm sure you all know, one of the, if not the major research library for art and architecture, particularly for architecture. They have um, summer, archival internships that 
uh, almost always involve one of our students uh, processing new collections and you know really training people what an archivist does at at that level. And those are that's a paid you know paid position. And uh, so there's lots of other sort of activities that relate to the program or 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 other parts of the university and that reach out to us looking for uh, looking for students to to bring into their their um, um, yeah, fellowships and employment opportunities. Yeah, what else am I forgetting, Mark? Um, I think all of those ways in which the program exists and expands and is amplified outside of the coursework is really important to understand because it's it the culture of the program is conversational and discursive and and there's a we have a good group of colleagues not only on GSAT but 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 who are friends of the program who come to reviews and 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 so when we visit museums to speak to a curator often those are people who are friends of ours and 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 so there's something about being in New York and being within the intellectual cultural space of New York that is really important for the program as well um oh, the, student initiated events yeah I forgot to talk about those yeah that, that's right also those yeah There's so a fantastic tradition oh, you can talk about those yeah I'll hand it yeah to so you. we have we have a great tradition of a student-run conference called interpretations and almost every year sometimes depending on you know for whatever reason um it skips a year but that students conceive of a theme or a topic or a set of research questions. They think of people they want to invite. Sometimes those people are architects or scholars or researchers or artists or novelists, De again, depending on the theme. Lately, we've had themes on disobedience and what that means. And what and we've had, we've had projects work, students working on um, intersections between literature and architecture. The first year was and at some level, a relatively straight set of questions around architectural curatorship, but but also a really important event that became the foundation for the yearly interpretations conference. And so the students not only conceive and think about the the structure of the symposium or the conference, they invite speakers, they serve as introducers and respondents sometimes, and and so it's a it's a just one example of the types of projects that you do within the program that are just kind of adjacent to coursework and adjacent to your own research, but are really helpful for you to not only meet people who might not be in New York or might not be at the school and people that you want to have a conversation with, but but they also allow you the, the experience of putting together um, an academic conference, which is very useful experience for many of you, especially those of you who are thinking about careers in academia or careers within cultural institutions. Um, but the, but I guess just thinking more about student-initiated projects, we've also had students who have proposed to travel as a group to Venice to study the Venice Biennale critically, um, not just to visit it and to visit the, um, the <laughs> pavilions, but but to engage the curatorial logics of the Biennale, to, to think critically about curatorial positions, to, to think the relationship between the Biennale and the civic structure of Venice. And, and we've had students do that a few times. And, um, and so often if students have a smart proposition like that, the school responds and with support and with enthusiasm for the project. And so things like that happen quite often. Yeah, sorry, I was interrupting. I was also saying that one year, uh, actually for the very first year of the Charger Architecture Triennial, our students um, uh, proposed and successfully were, you know, accepted to produce their own exhibition. So they traveled collectively to install that and and work in that context and also get to see that opening. So there are lots of ways in which collective travel can function. Um, uh, and, you know, it's not automatic. It has to be a proposal that goes, you know, so um, goes through sort of us and, um, but that's been a really productive site of people learning to work together um, and yeah, develop, develop real, real interests. So mm. yeah, we talk a little bit about the application process maybe and yeah, open it up. Um, um, so there, you know, sort of, 
straightforward on the one hand, um, you know, statement like a, a statement of your, your personal statement, and and we're looking at that um, really as an occasion for you to tell us about yourselves and your interests, you know, to sort of characterize what motivates you to be uh, thinking about and applying to CCCP, um, and and you know, it can take it can take a lot of forms. Um, but I think, you know, it is, it's helpful for Mark and I to, to get a sense of, you know, how you came to think about the program or why, you know, why it seems a relevant site for you to be developing, whether it be into scholars to go into PhD programs or into curators or, or, or even if you don't yet know, and yet at the same time have a type of curiosity that you can describe to us as, um, as an account of of why it might be useful to come, so it's a personal statement. We don't need you know lengthy details about your background unless they're particularly relevant to to what you're interested in doing. We're sort of interested in how you see yourself contributing, you know, or how you see yourself developing in the program and and um, uh, and being a, a sort of being a player in the field somehow that that's sort of the most useful thing I think to tell us um, um then that is a recommendation pretty clear um always good to have people that can speak in some detail about your work if you you know if you have that so they could be teachers collaborators yeah you know, there's like lots of ways to choose that but um in a way we're less interested in the most famous person you know, then someone that will actually write a letter and tell us a little bit about you. So let's think about who best that might be. Uh, and then there's this sort of generic um, term of portfolio. And this is the most tricky thing for CCCP because um, I mean, for some people, the, the portfolio part of the application will look like a design portfolio um, because that's really the core or really even the extent of the types of work that you've done today. For other people, it will be an occasion to show us work you've done writing or, you know, curating or, you know, drawing. It doesn't need to be a, we're not, that term is just a generic term used on GSAP sort of admission site, um, but we're not looking for a conventional design portfolio. We're looking to see how else you can describe yourself through the documents that you've produced and um, um, and how you edit them down to a, a you know small communicatable um, sort of claim on on what you do and who you are and and you know some people have never done design work we don't expect you to do design work to apply we expect you to think about the strengths you have so it can be an entirely writing portfolio for people that come from a writing background or can be a, a photo portfolio. I mean, if you come from an art background, it can be art, you know, so so think about how, how you want to best use that as a parallel channel to the description, to characterize yourself and your interests. That's that's really the the goal of the of the of the portfolio. Um yeah. I think they're the sort of yeah, I think um just to add one small thing to the portfolio discussion. Some of you might be coming from professional architecture backgrounds, and some of you might have, a, let's say, a conventional architecture portfolio. That's also not bad either, but it would be helpful for us in looking at that material or showing that material to us to recognize that we're not hiring you for technical skills or professional skills. We're interested in how you think about architecture, and that might be through writing, that might be through creating, but it might also be through design. Uh, one path through the project is that students Many of our students come from design backgrounds, and, and some of them are looking for different ways of practicing architecture, but some are thinking about how to return to design practice with a slightly different agenda or a different set of skills or different way of thinking. And, and so you might, if you have a design background, you might alert us to which projects or include the projects that you think pose some sense of what type of work best represents your critical reflections on practice and on what you're doing. Um, but we've also had students who are applying to the program because they have become dissatisfied with the kind of work that they're doing professionally. And so, you know, that, so they might have a portfolio of work that 
represents what they're moving away from rather than what they're moving toward. And so there'd be ways of using a portfolio of alerting a, us to how you're thinking about your future practice being different than where you've come from. So, so just think about the portfolio as also a kind of format that you're approaching critically, that you're, um, you're filling with different types of material, if that's what available to you, what's available to you, but, but that also performs in a way that helps us, like your statement, understand what your interests are and what you might do within the program. Maybe I'll just add one more thing before we open it up to questions, um, which is, uh, you know, it's the program critical curatorial and conceptual practices in, in architecture. Um, what we mean by architecture is quite broad and, uh, and sometimes um, it means architecture in the professional sense, sometimes, you know, as a discourse, as a, as a, as a discipline, sometimes, you know, just to come back to Mark's point, it's also uh, a site to challenge through different research, through different ways of asking questions or, or manifesting critiques. And, um, but it also beyond that means landscape, urbanism, um, uh, uh, sort of media technical systems. So, so it's not, I don't also, you know, don't want people to think we're focused on only on architecture in a conventional sense. I mean, it is a, an uh, architecture program within the school, um, but like many others, it's also one that's really designed to critically rethink the parameters of the discipline, how one might operate within it, how to practice in it, how to you know, have a less conventional design practice. That's often what people come into the program saying, you know, I finished my degree, I worked, and then I realized that this is not really what I want to do. I, you know, I want to be involved with architecture, but using very different voices and very different mechanisms and institutional frameworks. And, um, and you know, I, I sort of want to develop the skills to be able to, to mobilize, you know, otherwise, you know, differently. And, and so, so just to say architecture, um, you know, has scare quotes around it a little bit. It, it, you know, some people are very focused on, um, uh, is architecture as a professional, um, uh, you know, easily circumscribed practice, but other people are not, you know, are not, um, are not staying in that domain. So just to, in case that's helpful to anyone. Uh, okay, I think we should open up. Yeah. So who has questions? Yeah, feel free just to, Turn your mic on and yeah, and go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you still remember me. I was at the Yes, hey Daria. Yeah. Um, so I think I have one more question about the application process. Is that I was talking to Tatian. Is that yeah. his name? Yeah, and he told me that we have like different advisors that we can choose from to lead our thesis. But he like Stop halfway, so I was kind of confused. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what he meant. I don't think in, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but in the application process, there, you don't. Oh, you're cutting out, actually. Yeah. Uh oh, Dara, something's wrong with your mic. I'm so sorry. I type in the chat. Yeah. Are you talking about the thesis advisors or? Thesis advisors. Oh, that's easier. Yeah. Yeah. So thesis advisors are, um, uh, you know, there's there's a sort of core group of GSEP faculty that have tended to be students thesis advisors for CCCP. So Mark and myself, Babel Wilson, Reinhold Martin, Lucia Ale, Athea Karakawala, um, uh, Laura Kurgan. Um, so there, you know, there's been people that have advise students theses over many years. This year, actually, Andres Hake is advising a thesis and uh, Emmanuel Edmasu is advising a thesis. And um, But outside, we also allow, you know, if it makes sense for the particular student's interest, um, students to, you know, if we, if we think it's a good match and the person will really commit to doing the work because it's a lot of, um, hands-on work, um, being a thesis advisor. We, you know, students sometimes get thesis advisors from 
other parts of the university or even from people outside the university. Um, so this year, there's a number of alumni are uh, have been working as thesis advisors who, you know, the director of storefront or so if it makes sense for what a student is doing and how they want to work, then we can we can often set that up. It's up to the student to reach out to that person. Um, and then, you know, we follow up to make sure that that person understands the responsibility that they're taking on um, so that the student just doesn't get left behind. Um, but in principle, you know, any architecture faculty at GSAP in practice, more people that work in a research oriented mode, you know, tend to be better hands on thesis advisors. Um, but there are lots of options for thesis advisors. So, hmm. Thanks, Daria. Hi, Mark and Felicity. This is Ignis. Hi. Hello, Ignis. Um, hi, uh, thank you for the information. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the program might help students uh, who might be specifically interested in pursuing uh, PhD studies afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a it's a good question. We have actually a extremely high success rate of placing um, our students into PhD programs. Um, and the the real the real thing that we encourage people who want to to develop as a scholar and ultimately as a you know as a teacher and professor is to take you know more academically history theory oriented courses that 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 um require them to write research papers with a lot of primary source research like things that will give them uh, a voice as a scholar and a writing samples for the application process and and you know likewise i mean some students that have done phd programs have done a history theory thesis but not all that's not mandatory cccp is sometimes also a opportunity for those students to have a very different you know sort of voice or you know, public facing scholarship before going into PhD programs. Um, but I think that the the main thing is through course selections and um, in really making sure you have writing samples. We obviously work with students on their application statements if they're our students applying to programs and, um, you know, help them navigate the um, uh, the transition into PhD scholarship, but it's a good question. I think it's mainly through advice on, on, you know, on courses to take on how to approach them. Um, yeah. What am I missing, Mark? I think that's sort of the main. I think that, I think that's all really useful that I think, I think it's also worth stressing that the, especially the American architectural history theory degree is, is a very particular degree. And so many students have come to our program as a way of testing whether they're interested in the uh, American university PhD format and, and if so, how to become more familiar with what the expectations are and how to think about it. Um, uh, some international PhDs don't have the same coursework requirements that American PhDs have, and they don't have the same time commitment <laughs> that North American PhD programs have. And so using the program as a way of not only developing your own thinking and writing and research skills and finding a voice as a scholar, as Felicity said, and I think that's paramount, um, but also becoming aware of what might be required of you in, in a program in North America, I think is really helpful. And, and so we've had many, many students come from all parts of the world who have used the program as a channel into PhD studies. And, and I think that's a real success of the program is how many people have been able to do that. But, but I guess I would also add that because applications to those programs are so competitive, you also have to stand out as a writer and a scholar and a thinker. And so what Felicity's saying about voice is not the same thing as checking all the boxes and showing that you've taken your all of your history requirements. It's something else. It's like showing that you have a kind of conceptual agility, that showing that you have some kind of ability to work with primary material, showing that you have an idea, uh, some ability to take on complicated research topics, to challenge 
some of the premises of architectural thinking and its disciplines and, and, and how it reflects back on itself. And, and the top PhD programs are going to be interested in students who can do that, who can show up as, as sharp and agile intellectual interlocutors, not people that prove that they've taken all of the required courses. And so I think CCCP serves our students very well in that sense. Next question. <laughs> Because it always things that Mike and I forget to say, um, and 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 yeah, people have yeah questions that that would never have occurred to us, and they're really useful. And we often find that you know someone has a question, and a lot of other people are thinking about asking the same question, a little bit nervous about it. Just go right ahead. Nothing, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. you uh, Hi. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I have a question regarding the the career path that uh, this MCCCP's uh, graduate pursues, other than the ones already mentioned, such as PhD or uh, critiques or educator. Uh, what are other like examples uh, that the graduate of this program pursue after they finish? Yeah. Um, People send it also, up to yeah, go ahead. Editor, go ahead. Editions, editors for publications, um, as editors of magazines, as um, people have founded their own uh, research-based practices like the F Architecture Collective and others, like really asking the question of what architectural research looks like as a, yeah, as a, as a discipline. Um, people have ended up like the head of the Architecture League as a graduate of our program. Um, uh, so institute directors, people have founded their own galleries and research institutions um, coming out of the program. So, you know, there's a, there's a, like, I don't know, you probably have other things to add, but you know, there's no, a- No, 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 th that's a good spread. I was just, when Dario will remember this, th th this question came up in the open house and on campus. And I was just thinking, as an, as a, as a test, I was just trying to think of students who are in New York City. And, and so there's Jacob Moore, who is the director of the Architecture League. There's Jose Esparza, who's the director of the storefront for art and architecture, you know, one of the most important architecture galleries in the world. There's Augustine Shang, who's the production director at CARA, one of the most, one mm -hmm. of the most interesting spaces for art and architecture in the city now. There's Nora Kawi, who's a graduate who's he has a research practice and she's at Cooper Union. There's Marty Wood, who is uh, an, what, an associate editor, assistant editor at the Architects newspaper. There's Alex Tell at the Michigan Gallery. There's Joachim Hockel at the Met. There's Johnny Tran at the Met. Um, mm -hmm. And we've got people at MoMA. And so just that spread alone. And Zoe uh, Nailbuff, who is um, an editor for Inventory Press. And so you get a sense that as Felicity is saying, cultural institutions of different stripes, um, often museums and galleries, but but also publishing institutions and, and and academic institutions. Many of our students find their way into those kinds of spaces and those kinds of practices. Um, and that doesn't mean that you can't keep expanding um, <laughs> future yeah. for CCCP graduates. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't want that to sound like a sort of. Yeah, that's just that's just you know just the New York graduates who off the top of our head. But we had an event uh, for the ten year anniversary of the program in the desert in Wadi Rum, and which had some significance for the program because we used to to group travel there. Um, and we invited many of our graduates to come back to talk about the work that they had done since graduating. And 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 we've got a small publication. And uh, if any of you want the, one of those, you should just email us and we can find a way to get one to you. But, but what was interesting about that event is that students spoke about all of the different ways that they have developed practices since leaving. And, and it's an incredible breadth of, of ways of working. Um, some you know, I think we've hit most of them. Some people are very um, involved in academic scholarship, people who have opened their own research institutes, people who are back and forth, people who have a kind of foothold within the university, but but 
do research work outside of it. Um, but we also found a number of people, as Felicity noted, who have developed their own institutions or galleries or research spaces. And, and, and so there's a kind of, um, I, I'm using this term advisedly, a kind of entrepreneurialism within our graduates, which isn't like business school entrepreneurialism. It's a, people have found ways of, of, hmm. of inserting their research methods and interests into this, the cities and the places that they find themselves. They, through the thinking of the program, they've noted that there are forms of practice that are missing in the cities that they're in, and they found ways of, of instituting um, new spaces for architectural thinking and research. Um, and some of that is that, you know, all of our, the work of our graduates is just shockingly impressive, and you know, we're incredibly lucky in that sense. Um, but People, but, and Brock alluded to this earlier, have returned to the, a design practice, but with yeah. you know, retold with a slightly different ability to be able to articulate the stakes of their work and how they practice and, and these sorts of things. So this is, hmm. Yeah. Does that help you check? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Who else? Yona, this is your last chance. <laughs> Sorry, I might just ask one more question. Yeah, um, of course, Ignis. Uh, I know uh, Felicity's mentioned some ways that students can uh, perhaps work uh, to uh, kind of uh, during, during their studies uh, to kind of cover their living expenses. But I'll, I'm also interested in um, hearing about uh, the kind of funding uh, for the program, if, you know, the department provides support for students who might need it to cover the uh, tuition and cost of attendance. I know this might be something that uh, the scholarship office can talk in more detail, but just want to get a general sense. Yeah, I think your intuition is right. That's a question best addressed to the um, admissions office, and then they handle all of that. But, but we can tell you that there's a small a very small amount of scholarship funding available. This, this school is desperately trying to expand our endowment so that we can provide more. Um, but not every one of our admitted students gets funding. That That's certainly true. Um, but as Felicity said, there are other ways in which funding is made available to students through the uh, assistantship program, which is quite generous for students who can get that through research positions at the Buell Center and elsewhere at the university, through uh, different forms of work that students are able to do on campus in the exhibition spaces or in the gallery or in the publications office or through teaching. Um, and, and, and we try to be proactive in helping people get those positions within the school. Some of our students also work outside of the school and that's um, not in any way forbidden and people will pick up work in offices and they will pick up work in galleries. We have many students who do work in galleries at, while they're at the school. Um, that's usually easier in the second year when you have a slightly more flexible schedule, but it's quite common as well. We have eight minutes left. If there's any final questions. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for your questions. Thanks for your attention. If I, if you have other questions come to mind after we shut down the Zoom room, feel free to email us or email the admissions office and they'll pass on your email to us and we will get back to you, um, especially as you're getting closer to the application process, if something comes up that you want some feedback on, absolutely feel free to reach out to us.